Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Alex Roberts from the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Uh, I'm here with Daniel Gerson. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. And we're here today to uh, give an overview of two recent OECD reports about public sector innovation in the Brazil uh, context. Um, as you get any questions or, or queries, please feel free to put them in the chat feature um, and uh, we'll come to them in turn. Uh, to begin with though, we thought it might be helpful to just have a general overview of the context from Guilherme uh, from Enapi, who can provide a bit of uh, a sense of where did these reports come from and um, and then we'll dive into the detail and then go back to Guilherme for some responses to the to the the directions these reports have taken. Okay, Guilherme, would you like to give us a bit of a overview of the context? Of sure, sure, and um, and um, thank you. Uh, well, Alex and Daniel, good to have you here to take part in this webinar. Uh, well, back in two thousand and fifteen. Uh, ENAP, which is the Brazilian uh, National School for Public Administration, and OECD executed an, a memorandum of understanding focused specifically on public sector innovation. And in the context of such MOU, we have, uh, uh, we proceeded with three different reviews. Back in 2016, we started a review on a digital government, uh, which brought a, a new visions and approaches to the Brazilian uh, digital government processes. Uh, and based on the success of this report, we have engaged in two new reports, in two new re reviews. The first, well, an app is a school of public administration, a school of government, uh, linked to the Ministry of Economy in Brazil. And we have been dealing for a while with the challenge of updating capacity building for the skills of the 21st century. Our goal is to promote training for civil servants and, and uh, high level courses and understanding which would be uh, the needs uh, for capacity building, which skills are needed for senior executives and how could we better promote it both from the supply and from a demand side was a key issue. And then we uh, started a process, uh, procedures and we have engaged into a review focused on uh, the innovation skills and leadership in the Brazilian public sector. This is part of the review. Uh, this is one of the reviews actually. Uh, at the same time, we were facing some questions on to whether should we better promote an ecosystem for public sector innovation in Brazil. Uh, we have, back from 2015 as well, we have created a network for public sector innovation, which is called InnovaGov, which puts together seven, more than 100 different organizations from both public, private sector, academia, and several other aspects from, from of people interested in public sector innovation. And in that context, we noticed that there was room for improvement. We had been discussing public sector innovation for a while in Brazil, actually. We have had a innovation, some innovation awards for, for the public sector since back to 1996. So uh, we're not new to that, but we understood that there were several other possibilities and understanding better the context, the, the challenges and the opportunities would be a great way to improve it. So after the initial successful review on digital government, we engaged into two different reviews, one focused on uh, innovation skills and a second one focused on the innovation system of the public service of Brazil. Uh, those reports took some time to consolidate. They, they required uh, several missions from OECDs and peers to Brazil. Uh, dozens of people were consulted and interviewed during the processes, several back and forth reviews and discussions, 
but we succeeded in launching those two reports uh, a few weeks ago at the fifth edition of our uh, Public Sector Innovation Week uh, with the presence of Marcus Bonturi, the Director for Governance uh, at, from OECD. Uh, by now, both reviews are being translated and we expect them to, to play a relevant role in the administrative reforms we're about to, to go through in Brazil. It's important to, to stress that both reports, they were uh, started at a prior administration. So uh, we started during one administration and they are concluded at a different one after the elections we had in uh, 2018. Uh, this was at first something we would consider a risk but at the end, we found out that this was really uh, insightful because uh, bringing an external vision and external approaches and the relevance of OECD uh, analysis to the process uh, helped the, the, both topics to go through the transition process in a quite solid manner. Having an external vision, therefore, was quite relevant to bring a continuity to both agendas as long as Brazil is, uh, is working intensively to uh, work its way through for its accession process to OECD. By now, our future challenges are not only uh, translating the document, but also making them available to the bulk of public service and spreading the word and the ideas so that there is discussion and to the extent possible consensus on its findings and on the next steps, both in capacity building and in development of an innovation ecosystem. I think these are initial remarks, but I'll be, uh, I think it would be great if you could present both reports and then I'm here also for discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Guilherme. Uh, just a reminder for uh, participants, you can add your questions in the chat feature and we will answer them at the end of the, our presentation. And this, present, uh, this webinar will also be recorded uh, uh, and available for others at a later stage. Uh, to begin with, um, I will share a bit about uh, the first report on the public sector innovation system in Brazil. And it really gets down to the question of how can Brazil take a more deliberate and systemic approach to innovation? Because as we often see in jurisdictions, uh, innovation has often been a sporadic sort of reactive activity in many public administrations. So some of the key messages really are that uh, Brazil needs innovation to meet its ambitions and to solve real problems. Uh, Brazil has already been innovating. There's a lot of innovation that's occurred. But as we can see, when we look at the historical journey of Brazil, we know that this won't be enough. A deliberate and systemic approach is required. We also know that a systemic approach involves considering whether innovation is occurring to the extent needed, whether we're getting the right mix of innovation happening, and whether there's a degree of stewardship of the system. We know that a lot has already been achieved, but we also know that more will need to be done if the public service of Brazil is going to be able to consistently and reliably innovate. So to have a closer look at that, um, I'll dive into some more detail. Firstly, why this report? Well, it's emphasizing that innovation, which is about something that's novel to the context in order to achieve impact, really needs to be part of the repertoire of an effective government. Nowadays, innovation has to be at the core of government. It can't just be something done on the side or on occasion. We face challenges that are so complex and great that we need innovation on a routine, ongoing basis. Yet we know that while innovation has occurred, uh, particularly we've seen great examples in Brazil, uh, partly through those awards that Guilherme mentioned that have been occurring for quite some time, 
we know the innovation has not yet been systemic. But we know that it's no longer viable to treat innovation as a side effort. So we really have to uh, put it at the center. If we look specifically at the Brazilian context, well, we can see there are a lot of reasons that Brazil might want uh, a more considered approach to innovation. There are a whole re range of drivers and policy issues where innovation could well be helpful. For instance, uh, there's questions around inequality. There's uh, the financial position of the Brazilian government. There's an ongoing emphasis on fighting corruption. There's a need to deal with changing demographics. Um, there are a whole host of things where innovation can help. It's unlikely innovation is going to be the whole answer. Innovation isn't a magic bullet, uh, but it is something that's going to be needed. So this report was all about looking at uh, the extent to which innovation was occurring and how that could be enhanced. The first thing uh, that the report looks at is to consider the innovation journey thus far. We can see that the, over uh, the last three decades, there's been quite a lot of emphasis on uh, areas quite sympathetic to innovation. Brazil's seen a, a long and ongoing emphasis on debureaucratization, looking at how the public service can make things more efficient and streamline their processes. In the 1990s, there was a, a lot of emphasis on uh, new public management and some of the reform ideas there about streamlining processes and making government more effective. That was followed by a period looking at modernization and e-government. And now in the last decade, there's been a lot of attention to digital transformation and specifically focusing on innovation. This look at the history helps us understand the sorts of rhythms, the patterns that are inherent in the Brazilian public service. We can see that there are certain things that are repeated focuses. Um, that tells us a bit about the system and how it works. For instance, we can see that um, Brazil operates in a, a, has a very legalistic system. Um, we can see that there's a strong emphasis on controls and corruption and that recurrent focus on de-bureaucratization. We can also see that there's a lot of emphasis on the citizen. Um, there's been a, a very impressive focus on digital transformation in recent years. And we can see that innovation has gained momentum, but it's not really yet been integrated into the narrative of the public service. The reason that we look at this history is it can tell us a lot about um, how to approach the next steps. For instance, we can see that it's all very well for innovation to be mandated to be included in presidential decrees and laws. Um, but it's also clear that those declarations aren't going to be enough. While directives that emphasize innovation are helpful and probably necessary, the evidence we see over the past suggests that they're not going to be adequate in and of themselves to really uh, embed the practice of innovation in the public service. We can see that uh, we need to balance the, the, the structural emphasis within the Brazilian context on processes with something that can balance that with a focus on innovation. There are things that, that are already going on that are conducive to innovation, such as the emphasis on the citizen, which is a really important driver for a focus on innovation. But it's not always been successful. We can see that digital transformation and the transparency agenda can also help in this space. But it's probably that there's more needed um, we can also see that the reform agenda has been one that's ongoing and there isn't a simple answer to this. We can't provide a, a simple set of prescriptions that tell you this is how innovation can work. And if you tick all of these boxes, everything will be solved. Innovation is an ongoing journey and it has to involve continual change. 
We can also see that there are certain characteristics of the public sector as an institution, not just in the Brazilian context, that pro provide some reasons why there might be a, a shortfall of innovation, reasons why innovation may not be occurring to the extent needed, even though there are very clear reasons why innovation might be wanted. For instance, uh, risk aversion comes up in conversations with nearly any public sector we talk to, not just in the Brazil context. But there are very real reasons why risk aversion happens in the public sector. The public sector as an institution is built to avoid uh, negative feedback. Uh, it doesn't matter how well you do at something in the public sector, we all remember what goes wrong. Uh, political processes, political emphasis focuses on what goes wrong rather than what goes well. That's a big difference from say the private sector where you can put up with a lot of pain just on the off chance that there's profit at the end. So we need to recognize these inherent features of the public sector, recognize that they don't necessarily add to an innovation environment and think about how can we mitigate that? We can't become the private sector, nor should we, but we can try and work around this. We should also recognize uh, just that innovation is really quite hard to do, whether in the private sector or the public sector, because innovation is about uh, learning. Wherever you're at in the innovation journey, there's always further to go. And as you learn how innovation is done, how it can be supported will change. So it's an ongoing process of learning um, that you can never really master. All of this contributes to, to this thinking that we need to have a deliberate and systemic approach to public sector innovation. We need to have an approach that can counterbalance the difficulties of innovation and the inherent biases of the public sector against innovation. We need to move from a situation where a lot of innovation has been done because individuals have made exceptional efforts or because there have been crises or political commitments that have demanded novel responses. We need to move beyond that because we can see in today's world that's not going to be enough to deliver us what we need. So we think and we've uh, researched that a deliberate and systemic approach requires three things. Is innovation occurring to the extent needed? Is the innovation that is occurring likely to give us the right mix of options and choices? And is there some form of stewardship present to ensure that this innovation system is delivering as hoped? So to support this, we've, we have a couple of models that we think help illustrate uh, our thinking. And we test this against the Brazil situation in the report. The first is our determinants model, which really looks at what are the underlying things that determine whether and to what extent innovation is actually occurring and how those different forces can be influenced. Our determinants model thinks about three lenses of activity. We can think about innovation that's driven by individuals, which is what we see quite often, um, including in the Brazilian context. We can think about innovation that's driven by a, a single organization, or we can think about innovation that's drawn, driven as a systemic activity where the collective interests are integrated into the innovation process. And the key feature about this is that where you don't have innovation being driven at the systemic level, then the focus of innovation falls down to the organizational level which is inherently going to be about innovation that solves that organization's problems or issues. Again, that's not going to be a systemic thing. And where you don't have innovation at an organizational level, it falls down to individuals who are driving their own particular agendas driven by what they've seen, which again, isn't going to be collective. And the issue is, if innovation is driven primarily at that individual level, not only won't it necessarily focus on the big societal questions, but it's also going to be very vulnerable to those people leaving, moving on, burning out, 
or, or just getting tired. Innovation that's driven by individuals is really innovation that's driven by luck. It's not sustainable and it's not systemic. So we need to think about how to move innovation up from the individual to the organization and to the system levels. We also need to think about the portfolio mix of innovation. What are the different types of innovation activity that can be seen? We have our innovation facets model that we help thinks illustrate this. It, it talks about there being different types of innovation activity, whether it ranging from the enhancement oriented innovation space, which is really about building on what you've already got, adding new things, but uh, doubling down on existing approaches. It can be mission oriented, where you're trying to deal with a big audacious goal. The classic example being um, putting a man on the moon. It can be adaptive innovation, which is more driven by bottom up, where you see things changing on the ground and look at how to respond to that. Or it can be anticipatory innovation, which is really asking those big questions of what are we doing? And is that really the right thing to be doing, given the changing future? Now, each of these facets can help us think about what is the mix of activity going on in the context? And how is innovation activity being shaped? What directions is innovation being pushed in? So, for instance, in, a, in the Brazil context, where you've got quite a, a considerable risk environment where people are very conscious of the effect of, of risk and uh, taking risks, innovation is often going to be pushed into that enhancement oriented space. It's going to be pushed in directions where people are relatively confident that taking risks is going to be okay or not noticed. Um, but the question is, is that the sort of mix that you want? Is that a deliberate choice or is it happening because you're being pushed in directions unintentionally. And that third element is that question of system stewardship, which comes down to the fact that innovation is about uh, what's suited to individual contexts. It's about what is new to a specific context. And that means innovation is going to pull the system in different directions particularly in a, in a system as large and complex as Brazil, where you've got multiple, you know, thousands of, of local government situations. If every single one of those used innovative approaches that was specific to their context, then you sort of risk an overall coherent approach because 5,000 different approaches is going to offer a lot of tension at a national level where you want some degree of interoperability and coherence. So we suggest that there needs to be some consideration of stewardship, some form of uh, collective consideration of the whole. And we're aware stewardship doesn't translate easily into the Portuguese language, um, but we're still uh, thinking about how we can best illustrate that. And there's some examples in the report that help. Then when we look at the, the lived experience of Brazil, when we test our models and our thinking against what we saw in the Brazilian context, well, we saw that much of the innovative activity that was occurring was driven by individuals or organizational perspectives rather than systemic ones. We saw that there was a, a lack of uh, emphasis on those underlying determinants which shape systemic activity. And we saw that the current structure of the innovation system is pushing innovative activity in particular directions, namely towards that more incremental and uncontroversial innovations, despite there being a need for perhaps more radical exploration and experimentation with other forms of innovation. And we saw that the existing stewardship of the system isn't really recognized or, or seen as official. It's been very much implicit or sort of uh, happened by uh, circumstance. The, the report has a, a whole chapter where we appraise current efforts against our model and really think through how are existing measures placed to deal with these things. 
Um, I won't go into full detail here. The report has plenty of information about it, but I just wanted to highlight that what we saw is there's a lot of good stuff going on, but we think uh, a more deliberate approach is needed if that's going to take it to the level required. Another part of the report also looks at different scenarios of the future to sort of play out, to tease out how different scenario, how different dynamics might play out under different settings. Each of these scenarios is about helping us think of, to test assumptions, to test, you know, what is it that would really be required to change things um, and how uh, our existing measures how might they play out over time? What would those effects be? So this isn't to advocate a particular scenario or path. We're not trying to pick favorites here and say, this is the way you should go. We're trying to illustrate that there are a range of possible futures and that it's gonna depend on, on the actors and the, the uh, players within the system to sort of decide what's best. We just wanted to help illustrate some of that. And to do so, we use three scenarios. One looking at how might the system continue if we go with what is. The next scenario is, you know, what if we built upon those? What if we took them further? And this, the, the third scenario looks at what if innovation was really moved to the center? What if a lot of emphasis was placed on it? What would that mean? And each of those scenarios help us think about what are the different options available and how might they work over time? Because it's very easy to come up with an option and say, this, this suits our needs right now, but we know we're in a very changeable world and things can change very quickly. We don't want to rely on the assumption that today will be, that tomorrow will be the same as today. The report also uh, acknowledges some of the things that have already been achieved. So it's really worth pointing out and highlighting and emphasizing that, you know, there have been some big successes so far. Uh, some of those have been the innovation awards, which really provide a, a rich source of insight into innovation in Brazil. Uh, they really help underscore the value and importance uh, in the work of the public service. And they, they provide inspiration to others about what can be done and help share some of the learnings and the experiences of different innovators. Uh, we can also see the establishment of Inovagov, the INITES and Innovation Week. I got to attend the last Innovation Week um, and it, I think it's a fantastic event. All of these things uh, are great mechanisms for helping to socialize innovation, to connect and empower people within the system and across the system, to help people learn from each other and to help build uh, momentum for the agenda. We can also see there's been a lot of collaboration between some of the major actors in the system. Um, indeed, uh, our, our report was jointly sponsored by a number of different partners within the system. And I think that's really fantastic. There's been a very encouraging uh, growth of innovation labs and innovation efforts across different agencies, which have highlighted how to test new approaches and new thinking uh, to explore different ways of working in very different contexts. And then I think they've all contributed to building up that innovation sophistication and a maturing practice of innovation and what it means to the Brazilian context. And we can also see that the digital transformation agenda has played a really important role in highlighting the value that change can bring to the public service. And it provides a bit of a model for how a broader public sector uh, system level transformation can and might occur. In the report, again, we don't try and say, this is what you must do, or this is what's going to solve all of your problems, because we know that any solution we provide might be come out of date tomorrow. Public sector innovation systems are, are very fast moving things. They, they're influenced by political choices, by cultural uh, traditions and contexts, by historical things, um, by investment decisions and so on. There are a lot of factors that shape where the innovation system should go and how to get there. So 
all we want to do is highlight here are some things that we think will be useful prompts, useful starting points for discussion, and that might provide uh, an entry point for advancing the system to become more mature, where innovation is more systemic, more consistent, more deliberate, more reliable, rather than being something that's happened on an ad hoc basis driven by individual needs or political crises. Uh, so in the report, we have a whole chapter looking at these key areas of opportunity. Uh, here I can just mention how we've divided some of the, these key areas into for different audiences. So for instance, we have a number where we think about the whole of system needs to, to play a role where all of the actors need to come together and think about how to advance this. And some of those priority areas we uh, suggest uh, to establish an explicit agenda for public sector innovation. There's a lot going on, but it's not quite clear yet what exactly is wanted from innovation, when is it needed, and, and how it's going to be supported. Maybe that can be made more explicit. We think more attention needs to be given to the structural drivers for innovation. So that's about how do you offset the inherent inertia within the system the inherent bias within the public sector that leans against innovation with things that will push for innovation. So how, do, for instance, does the audit function focus on the risks of not innovating as well as the risks of doing things in different ways? And we think there needs to be an explicit responsibility for stewardship of the public sector innovation system. For so central actors, uh, one of the priority sort of area of opportunity that we suggest is that all of the big agencies should have an explicit role in regards to the system and its functioning. So for instance, uh, ENAP has played a, a very important role in regards to public sector innovation. It's provided a lot of thinking, it's provided a lot of training and so on. Um, but how does it relate to the Ministry of Economy and its role in pushing some of this agenda? How does it relate to TCU and others in, in their uh, respective roles? For the Ministry of Economy, we think it's important that the, the links between public sector innovation and digital transformation are made clear. Um, for the control bodies, we think it's important that they think about how to identify how control processes such as audit and risk management can support a focus on innovation, whereas too often it's been seen as a, a reason or an excuse not to look at innovation. For an app, uh, we think on behalf of the InnovaGov network, they could partner with relative and actors across the ecosystem to develop an annual high level commentary and sets of observations about the performance of the public sector innovation system that could be shared at Innovation Week, just to help highlight the learning that goes on every, every year and to keep emphasis and momentum on this agenda. And for individual actors, individual agencies, we think it's, it'd be really useful if they could think about where innovation is needed in their operations and publicize those priorities. That will make it easier for the people who work in those agencies or with those agencies uh, from outside of the public sector to know about how they can best contribute their innovation efforts. And as I say, the full, um, full list of areas of opportunity and the background thinking for why they're uh, probably the best places to start are included in the full report. Um, I should also just mention, as long, along with the report on, a, on the OPSI website, we also have a, an executive a highlights document and a, a slide deck, a briefing deck that captures some of this, just to help uh, make some of this material a bit more accessible, because we know public sector innovation systems, it's a big concept. It's not the easiest thing to get your head around, to get to grips with. So we've tried to make it a bit more accessible through a range of materials. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Daniel to talk a bit about his uh, report on 
skills and leadership for innovation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex, uh, also for this overview of your report, which we should say we really uh, did in, in, in a collective fashion. In fact, the first mission we, we conducted together, we spoke to many of the same people. So they, are, they, they became two separate reports, but they both have a bit, uh, they share a collective soul, I think we could say. Um, however, they did start in slightly different places. And I'll talk a bit about why this leadership report came to be um, before I get into the actual content of it. Uh, we actually did a big, pretty thick, report and analysis of Brazil's uh, civil service and its opportunities for civil service reform back in around 2010. And in that report, we found that there was a very rigid and quite difficult public sector system, civil service system that had been established over the years uh, that was not very agile that was structured through many different careers, uh, which tend not to speak to each other, which tended to actually sometimes work against the collective interest. Uh, and th there was a bit of a lack of um, uh, leadership and vision for what kind of future civil service was required. And over the years, uh, we've been refining a little bit what kind of vision for a civil service is required to actually uh, address the challenges that, that most governments, well, all governments across the OECD are facing. And the concept of innovation really encapsulates many of those challenges. And rather than sort of revising the 2010 study that we did, it became increasingly clear that the concept of innovation is a rallying call for rethinking the fundamental ways that we organize our civil services uh, made a lot of sense. And the point of contact, the most perhaps pivotal group of people that have the control and the power to really implement or drive change, or at least uh, enable change, allow it to happen, whether it comes from up or down or, or outside or inside, uh, are the senior civil servants, those people who hold the highest positions in the organizational hierarchies in the Brazilian context, these are people with DAS five uh, and six positions or with um, the FCPE equivalents. And in these positions, what we found in 2010 was that there was uh, very little coherence or consistency or approach to really even being able to manage uh, the, the types of people that are put into these positions and the, their ability to perform once they're in this position. So that was a particular challenge. And we see this challenge through a number of angles. The first is that there's a clear link to productivity and to efficiency. We know that Brazil actually has a very expensive civil service. Uh, in fact, if we compare the numbers, the basic data between uh, the cost of remuneration, for example, in Brazil's civil service versus that in OECD countries, uh, in, o in the OECD average, it's about 10% of GDP. In Brazil, it's closer to 13 uh, that's it's a significant sum of money. Uh, in, and, and when we look at it as a percentage of public expenditure, the, and on average in OECD countries, it's about 20%. So 20% of all government spending goes to paying the salaries of public servants. In Brazil, it's almost 30%. This is quite a big difference. And so one of the arguments that we put forward in this report is that there may be good reasons to have this difference, but it is a significant investment. And this investment needs to be managed and well led. So how do you manage an investment in people? Well, you make sure that they are supported, 
that they are uh, inspired, that they are directed in ways that allow them to do their job in the most effective ways, in ways that really allow them to use their talent or to develop their talent to meet the most pressing needs, which we have framed now as innovation. So that's one argument. There's a, a, a real productivity loss if we're not getting the most out of our public servants, and that is a particular leadership challenge. We also uh, are very aware of the profound challenges in public trust in government in Brazil at the moment, and you know across the OECD as well. Uh, all of the numbers point to uh, uh, lower than, uh, than required trust in governments across the OECD. And there has been a lot of good work now linking directly people's perceptions of integrity in the public service to their trust. It's not surprising. If you assume that all of your uh, public administration is corrupt, you probably won't trust them. And there's also interesting research that links the role and effectiveness of senior civil servants, those people in the highest levels, to more integrity in the public service. There are various different arguments as to why this might be, but having a highly qualified professional senior civil service seems to be a big indicator towards having uh, less corruption in government and thereby having a greater trust from the citizens. So this is a second argument as to why it's incredibly important to focus on these senior civil servants. Not only can they produce more output, but they also stand to build trust in public services. And finally, of course, they stand to support innovation. We know that in most cases of innovation, leadership support is generally seen as one of the most important uh, supports. That, uh, and it can also be lack of, therefore, is also one of the biggest barriers to, to successful public sector innovation. So understanding what kind of leadership is required to drive more innovation in a public sector is one of the key challenges to really understanding what public leadership should be today. And that was really, to be honest, the starting point for this study. So we, we aimed to think through with Brazilian civil servants what kinds of skills and competencies are needed across senior civil servants to grow and support more public sector innovation and to perhaps become stewards of a public sector innovation system. What kind of uh, policies, programs, and reform activities does that then imply? And how does the various ongoing perform, uh, policies, programs, and reform activities in the Brazilian public service line up with this kind of vision? And what kind of specific recommendations could we provide? Well, what does public leadership for public sector innovation look like? This is uh, an unanswered question. And I don't think there's a simple formula or a simple set of skills that we can ever point to saying that's what the public leader of tomorrow needs. I think we can probably agree that they are highly contextualized, probably more so than other forms of public sector leadership have been. So what's required is a public sector leader who is really able to understand their situation within which they exist and find the right leadership tools that match those particular challenges in that particular place and time. But we have done some work on trying to understand what the skills are across a successful public sector organization that is able to engage in innovation and produce successful innovation. And through various different uh, iterations of our process, we've come down with these six core skills areas for public sector innovation. And I'm not gonna go into them in detail right now because we don't have a lot of time, but suffice to say that this is not meant to be a leadership model. This is meant to be more of sort of an organizational view. 
right? What do we think we need to support in our organizations? And therefore, how do civil servants themselves need to at least be aware of some of these different skills areas and perhaps specialists in a number of them as well? But if we ask what does a leader need to be able to lead innovation? Well, one of the answers could be found in this model because ultimately leadership is about producing a desired outcome through a workforce. That means that the leader themselves aren't necessarily making the change happen. They are ensuring that they're surrounded by people who have that knowledge and skills and that they're allowing their organizations to develop those knowledge and skills and then organizing them in ways that allow them to make sure that they're being used. And so one of the answers to our leadership question is, what does a leader need to be innovative? Well, they need to have a workforce that is able to put these kinds of skills into action in service of innovation. All right, so if we take that as a starting point, then we can actually begin to measure where some of these skills may exist or not. And we, we did that through a bit of our own experiment. We actually created a survey, which was launched through an API, uh, which broke down each of these sub skills, each of these skills into more sub skills. And it asked respondents to answer on three questions for each skill. How, uh, how confident do you feel in your own ability to use this skill? How supported do you feel by your manager? How does your manager enable you to use this skill? And do you feel like your organization is ready to put these skills into action? Three elements. One, looking at individual self-assessment. The second, asking people to assess their manager's capabilities and supporting them to do this. And the third, looking at the organization. And here's what we found. Essentially, the yellow area is the perception of self. So it seems like Brazilian civil servants have sort of a middle level assessment of their own skills. If we take all of the answers, we got almost 3000 answers, by the way, which is a drop in the bucket. This isn't a statistically uh, a significant, you know, and, and, and excellent sample size, but it, it provides a little bit of, of input for reflection, let's say. There seems to be people having a strong sense of curiosity, uh, less confidence around skills related to iteration uh, or user centricity, really understanding who the users are of the services. Uh, a relative, you know, some sort of medium level comfort level with the other skills areas. However, when we ask people to look at their perceptions of their management ability to support them, it's obviously significantly lower. That's the area that is represented by the gray. And the perceptions of their organization's readiness fit somewhere in between the two. By the way, we also, as I said, created these sub skills. So this one allows you to see all of those sub skills in more detail. Um, and you can see that there are some specific gaps that people identify around IT 1.2, which we defined as prototyping. So there is a very low level of uh, confidence around the use of prototypes. And also particularly on user experience 3.6, where it's, this is the use of behavioral insights. And so if Anapi is looking at uh, developing some of these skills areas, this might be a useful place to invest. So, Maybe one of the leader's jobs is to make sure that their workforce has the right skills and then that they're able to be able to activate those skills in service of, uh, of innovation. We then continued by trying to take, look, look rather from the top down into the workforce, but rather look from the workforce up to the leadership. And we ran a couple uh, uh, workshops where we worked with people who were part of the innovation uh, community in Anapi to ask them, what kinds of leadership do you need to actually do your job more effectively? What, what would your dream public sector leader look like? And 
again, we took all of these answers and we tried to make a little bit of sense out of them and we created this model, which is really based on what we heard from these uh, Brazilian public sector innovators, uh, which filter into three main skills groups, all on a foundation of public service values and ethics. And so these are business skills, you know, being able to actually align resources with need in various different management tools. Uh, there was a whole bunch, well, again, of course, obviously the innovation skills that I've just talked about, that I've just shown are important. Um, what do those look like at the leadership level? You know, certainly we don't need uh, leaders to all be uh, experts in data, uh, in data science or in uh, using iterative processes, but they do need to understand how those, those processes are supported, how they are led, what kinds of questions they can ask their civil servants, how they can provide the right kind of management frameworks, or how they can just create the space required for those who are using these tools to use them professionally. And then the third one, which was probably the main points of discussion for most people, was around what we've called mindsets. This is, uh, it's, it's, it's not really behavior, it's not really a skill uh, knowing how to do something tangibly. But these are, you know, empathy, understanding people, being able to empower uh, civil servants, innovators, uh, even um, citizens to, to co-create with innovators. Uh, understanding continuous learning and what, what the role does that play for themselves and for their organizations. Uh, courage came up a lot as a word. You could call that an orientation, a mindset, a, a personal trait. Um, digital, what does it actually mean to organize services and concepts in a digital way. So we present this as, again, a way of continuing a conversation, a way of trying to organize lots of the rich input that we received from uh, civil servants in Brazil. But it's not an end in and of itself because it's nice to be able to crystallize what it is that you want your leaders to be and to do. But unless we think about how the system is structured around these people, it'll only ever just be a nice dream. And this is where we actually began developing a new model, a new way of thinking about what a senior civil service system actually looks like. So most OECD countries have some kind of senior civil service system, some kind of structured process that explains what kind of leadership they want to have, develops leaders to try and be that kind of leader, selects and chooses leaders based on those kinds of criteria that exemplify that leadership behavior and have some sort of system that reinforces this kind of leadership behavior once leaders are in place. So we thought of this in kind of a supply and demand model. How do we build the supply of leaders that have the skills I've just been talking about? We need to be able to clearly define what those skills are. We need then opportunities to develop those skills both in people who are currently leaders, but even more importantly, in the pipeline, those who will become the future leaders. It also really helps to be able to map the workforce in some way to actually see where these skills are already available so that you know who to call on for different leadership challenges as they arise. And how do we then also create a learning culture for innovation? Right? How do we make sure that these skills are constantly being learnt and revised and built upon? That's kind of on the supply side. On the demand side, how do we make sure that we are calling for leaders to work this way? I mean, the first step is to make sure that we're actually appointing people and we're using these as criteria in our selection. 
if we say we want leaders to do X and then we appoint people based on Y, what does that say about X? It, it, it's, it says that we're not actually serious about what we're saying we want leaders to do. So we need appointment processes that actually have some kind of transparent vetting of potential candidates against the clear criteria that we want, in this case, innovation related criteria. And then once leaders are in place, there needs to be some kind of support through uh, training, but also through performance and accountability mechanisms. If we hired you and we said we wanted you to be an innovative leader, how are you going, how are we going to make sure that you still are going to be that innovative leader once you are in place? So the rest of the report really looks at these two elements, the supply and the demand. I'll, if I want to encapsulate the main findings in one sentence, it's that in Brazil, there seems to be a fair bit of effort going into building the supply of leadership. Innovative leadership on some levels and better leadership on other levels. There's a lot of various little bits of innovation training happening in different pockets in different areas, much led by Anapi, and much of it very good. But there is very little being done on the demand side. And that is certainly part of the political system that has been uh, designed through the constitutions of Brazil, where appointment processes are uh, done by the political uh, level at the, at the will of the president and the ministers. And so building the demand is, is a clear political challenge. It requires uh, political buy-in and it requires in some ways politicians to let go of a little bit of the uh, power and autonomy that they have been awarded through, uh, through the, the election process and through the constitution. And so that is a much more difficult challenge to address. When we look at the recommendations that we have provided in this report, uh, again, on the supply and the demand side, we've tried to structure the recommendations in three categories. So on the left, uh, we have recommendations that are sort of immediate. We think you can probably take these on today, or in fact, we're happy to say much of these are already being taken on since the uh, discussions that helped us to crystallize these already began quite a long time ago. And building on those, there's sort of a set of second stage recommendations and then we also try to present some longer term recommendations, which we couch in this, you know, careful language, because clearly, um, as we try to practice what we preach, iteration requires learning as you go. And so by the time you get to the longer term recommendations, you may have learned many things in the meantime that mean these longer term recommendations have to, by definition, be rather fuzzy, because you'll be able to uh, make them clearer over time as you implement the immediate and second stage recommendations. So building the supply, we saw this in two main streams of work. One is that, you know, our reflection on the fact that there are lots of interesting initiatives out there in Brazil, because Brazil is a big complex country with multiple layers of government and so many different careers and so many different ministries acting on their own. One of the big challenges is to try and unify this, bring this together uh, around, you know, through both um, better networking and perhaps developing a shared vision of what does this innovative leadership really need to look like. And so at the beginning, we suggest that Anapi and others could begin uh, developing kind of a hub, which we know they've already been doing, to bring in uh, the different people working in this space to map this out more clearly, to include some of the people at subnational levels in the provinces, to include civil society who are taking big steps towards trying to support governments to, uh, to address some of these challenges. Um, and building on this, they could use this network to develop a more unified innovative leadership competency model. 
uh, something you know that reflects some of the skills in our model earlier, but is really divine, uh, defined through a collaborative process uh, that everybody can buy into. And from there, the question is then about how do you align the ecosystem of leadership development, which is sort of the second stream, is ensuring that training is responsive and effective and available. And so looking at the training offers, we uh, have recommendations around creating greater transparency, making it clear what training is available and where, so that uh, civil servants who are looking for innovation-oriented training can find it easily. The second is to then conduct a skills analysis if we, if we move from the top part about where we're creating a, a, an innovation competency model, how do we begin aligning the various training to that competency model to make sure that it is in some ways um, effectively moving towards the same vision of leadership in Brazil's public service. If we look to the demand side, which is where I said are the bigger uh, challenges in many ways, um, one main stream of work is on developing more merit-based hiring practices that assess innovation competencies at these higher levels, at these levels that have traditionally been uh, appointed uh, with very little in place. And of course, we're very happy to see that uh, this government has taken on uh, some of these initiatives already, that there is a presidential decree that has for the first time established some minimum criteria for DAS and FCPE positions. That's a great starting point. It sends an important signal that not anybody should be uh, doing these jobs. But of course, it's a starting point. There is a much further to go before it is developed into a genuine senior civil service system that can really uh, focus onto the kinds of skills and competencies and leadership that we're talking about in this report. Um, so a great starting point, but just a starting point. The, so you know, better understanding where already in the federal public administration these kinds of merit-based practices are being used is a very important beginning because they are being used in some areas and some pockets, understanding why that works, where it does, is a very powerful uh, approach. Secondly, you know, building on these, we can see uh, ANAPI perhaps taking on some pilots to support uh, this kind of hiring and recruitment, and then longer term, you know, thinking about scaling that up and embedding it in legislation. This longer term vision is a longer term vision. One of the biggest risks is that uh, the government try to take too much of this on too quickly and it fall apart under the weight, under its own weight. And that just helps to reinforce uh, some of the narratives around, oh, this could never work in Brazil. It could, it just needs to be done carefully and smartly. The second line is around innovation oriented objectives in job profiles and performance assessments. This is also very hard to do. Uh, innovation is not something that can easily be measured. It's not something that can easily be uh, used as a mechanical performance objective. I said I would do innovation, I did it, therefore I get a bonus. So it would be a mistake to uh, oversimplify this, but it does need to be reflected somehow in the job profiles of these civil servants, because they are facing great risk, personal risk. We have heard many stories of civil servants attempting to undertake innovation and finding themselves in legal troubles uh, because they crossed into some gray areas uh, despite their best intentions. And when there's no clear job description and role for someone to take on an innovation, for someone to say, I am in charge of this part of the public administration and one of my objectives is to improve it, to achieve better outcomes. Here's the targeted objective, here's the targeted outcome. When there's nothing that allows them to lean back on that, then it's clear that the, the objectives can only be personal or the risk is only personal. So 
there needs to be some reflection on how can innovation be seen as part of the job description of senior civil servants. Therefore, holding them, giving them some kind of um, performance incentives and some kind of cover so that they can say, I was, I was being accountable. I was doing what my job description asked me to do. Um, I'm going to stop there because I think you have heard a lot from both Alex and I, uh, but we're very happy to uh, move back now to, um, to Grievne, who I think is going to perhaps try to moderate some questions uh, if anybody has any. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel and Alex. Just some, some quick feedback from, from the current status. And one of the, the crazy things on um, dealing with innovation is that we are in an ever changing environment and things keep rolling. And it's really good to hear that uh, your vision is that some experiments, particularly in the field of innovation skills and capacity building and leadership, that the continuous activities should be dealt in order to experiment and to trial what could work and not. And there's some new information, which is quite uh, aligned to what you have told. Uh, I was just, uh, I, I made a, a, a screenshot of the, the last screen in which you suggest that the idea of piloting either approaches to competency assessment or to perform performance assessment processes would be a necessity. And uh, something great is that uh, here at the Enapri, we have a, a, an area which is focused on recruitment and selection, uh, which was originally tied to the area, uh, to the department, uh, focused on, on training. Uh, and now it's part of the innovation department. We have so much recognized that uh, evolving uh, the demand side uh, or is something which requires uh, experimenting, trial and error, uh, piloting and discovering. And therefore this area is now under the jurisdiction, under the supervision of the, uh, the innovation department uh, together with other innovative practices and visions. So. I think this is a, a good uh, sign that we are working intensively and that the reports not only provided adequate uh, vision on the context and on the challenges, but also uh, good suggestions on the path forward. Uh, similarly, we have been discussing with different uh, departments within the Brazilian presidency uh, on the necessity of the having a stronger role in the stewardship of the uh, in government innovation policies. So uh, from different perspectives, different organizations within the president presidency are starting to, to play this role of uh, organizing the conversation and promoting and suggesting activities to enhance the stewardship of uh, public sector innovation. I do believe that uh, we, uh, uh, the reports have already uh, promoted some change in our context, but that the change will be even more intense as long as uh, documents are finally translated and revised and disseminated to a broader Brazilian audience. I think it's one of our challenges and roles for the next year, not only to keep the conversation going from our side in order to, to disseminate the results of what we have done so far, but also to keep it this evolving by creating networks and engaging more people in this conversation and by uh, disseminating as well the results of such pilots and tests. Uh, 
So I uh, do understand that we have a moment here in which we somehow have concluded uh, some extensive and collective work in both fields. But from our side, uh, the fun is, the more fun is yet to come. We have strong challenges in implementing those ideas and those visions and those suggestions, and also in bringing more people on board and aligning this in a way in which uh, we expect the final results to, to promote the skills we need for uh, a more effective uh, Brazilian civil service uh, uh, system and civil servants. I think we have had some comments here. I'm not sure how you want to proceed. I'm not sure if we should respond them uh, jointly. I can uh, browse through and give my personal visions as well. Should we go to the... Uh I, the, I think one question I can see, Guilherme, is um, whether we had any findings about the role of public universities in the innovation system and, and what that role should be. Yeah. Uh, I, from my perspective, I think um, what's most important is to is that the public sector needs to start thinking about the broader ecosystem in a in a deliberate fashion that. There are a lot of different actors who contribute to innovation, whether it be about identifying new problems, whether it be about generating and uh, sourcing new ideas, whether it be about implementing new approaches. Um, I think universities can apply, can provide a lot of insight into, into uh, identifying problems, into coming up with new solutions, whether it be new technology or new policies or, or new uh, practices. And they can provide a lot of rigor uh, to those practices. They can help uh, in, in terms of understanding uh, how processes, well, how implementations have gone and whether they've done, been done as well as they could have been. Uh, they can provide a lot of rich insight around studying innovation awards and understanding the innovation process. Um, so I'd just say, in my mind, there's a lot that the universities can do. It's not something we focused on within the report, because obviously there are a lot of actors within the broader ecosystem and each can play a role on their own. Uh, but that was just my, my answer there. From, from my side, I can take an even more narrow focus and just also remind that universities in many ways create the pipeline for public sector civil servants, but also for public sector leaders. Uh, most, I think almost all civil servants in, in the federal administration have are graduates of university. And so we actually just had a, a, a symposium here two weeks ago at the OECD on, on recruiting the next generation of public servants. And one of the interesting points that was being made is the importance of developing stronger linkages between governments and universities to be able to um, better target graduates and make and, and clarify for current university students and future students what the opportunities are uh, in government. Because if we can't get good people from universities to come into government, then chances are we're not going to get much public sector innovation happening. And we're not going to be able to uh, fix many of the big challenges that we see with the public sector. And so um, while I completely agree with everything that Alex has just said, I would also remind that there is a very specific role for universities in feeding uh, the next generation of public servants. And so universities both need to be teaching the right things, but also to be presenting the public sector as a valuable, viable, uh, and and commendable place to go and work. So uh, I think that's that's fundamental. And into that, and, and agreeing with you both, uh, I would add that uh, I've been working with public sector innovation for quite a while in Brazil, and I realized there's some, I wouldn't say misunderstanding, but the lack of clarity, because I, I do agree that universities have uh, uh, I would say crucial role 
in, uh, in innovation policies. I would say that uh, a relevant part of the uh, way we create more knowledge is having the state promoting and sponsoring uh, a stronger connection between governments, uh, uh, universities, and the private sector in order to develop innovation. When we're talking about public sector innovation, we're more frequently talking about uh, policy innovation rather than innovation policies. I would frame this uh, as thinking that mostly we are uh, in the context of public sector innovation, we're more uh, strongly focusing on how to do things differently in government rather than creating totally new knowledge which could be used uh, in different ways. Uh, this is to say that there is also, in my perspective, an overlap between innovation policies and policy innovations. And in that context, we should uh, we can and we, we must bring university on board more frequently in order to promote public sector innovation. Uh, here from an outside, we have been uh, in contact with different universities, uh, research centers, and we quite frequently use uh, specialists in, in our innovation activities. So we bring on board universities and researchers to provide uh, basic guidelines and, and information on what is to be done. But this is easier for us because here at ENAP, we are a school and therefore we have research and innovation departments. I think part of the challenge to make this uh, more directly connected to what uh, could and should be done is to bring university also more directly into policies in a broader manner by uh, providing easier connections uh, with government, uh, between government and universities in order to make this impl impl to speed implementation and to bring new visions. One uh, idea we are about to pilot here is to bring universities on board in order to pilot uh, public policies. The uh, Brazilian government has some uh, critical questions whenever pilot programs are to be implemented because usually implementing pilots may be quite as costful and cumbersome as implementing real policies. So uh, quite most frequently, uh, po uh, pilots are not fully implemented or are not implemented before real, the effective and full policy is implemented. Maybe creating faster and more straightforward ways to engage universities would be a way to bring pilots to the forefront and to use uh, testing and uh, quick and fast appraisals as a new reinforcement way to make more efficient policies. Uh, there's also been a question about uh, the role that open innovation can play in the Brazilian public sector innovation system. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say that uh, to, to our mind, open innovation can be a, a very valuable tool. Uh, it recognizes that a lot of the answers aren't necessarily going to come from within government, but may come from outside experiences, whether it be in Brazil or more from the, the broader world. Uh, but I'd also say at the same time that, that open innovation uh, tends to be associated with particular types of innovation activity. It can be very good when you know what your broad aim is um, and others can come in with solutions that they have from other contexts. It may be less good, say, in uh, what we call the anticipatory innovation space or the adaptive space where uh, the questions may not be as clear um, and where uh, you're undertaking more exploratory types of things. Um, so I'd say that open innovation is, is valuable, uh, but it won't always be uh, 
its value will change depending on the questions and the context you're in. Uh, adding to that, uh, I do agree that uh, open innovation may certainly help to explore some of the innovation facets we have discussed uh, 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 a while ago. And we're also experimenting with that within Brazil. One of the key uh, initiatives we are uh, holding here at the school is to, uh, was to create a challenge platform, a platform for, for public challenges, uh, desafios, uh, in gov.br slash desafios, which is a way in which public sector organizations can suggest uh, challenges and give awards, including money for the best suggestions, answers, or prototypes, and even an additional uh, funding for, for, to, for the better implementations of those who have been selected in prior rounds. So we are also experimenting with new platforms and methods to bring uh, you know, open innovation uh, to the public sector innovation discussions by promoting tools that allow uh, organizations to experiment and to invest in new methods to engage uh, academics and society and startups and companies uh, in, this, in solving uh, stringent uh, public problems. Let's see how it turns out. I think it's still a quite uh, promising initiative, but as we mentioned, it's a test. We are running, uh, innovating is about taking risks and making experimentations. And I think we are doing this in all of the different aspects of those uh, next steps. So uh, it, part of this, I guess, uh, involves creating a solid community on public sector innovation and on keeping the conversation going. So I'd like to take the opportunity as well to, to thank all those who have uh, participated to this webinar so that we can better disseminate our visions and uh, the future of the public sector innovation, both from the perspective of capacity building and of the creation of a public sector ecosystem. From our side, uh, I think we'd like to thank you as well for this opportunity to share the reports with you. Um, and I, uh, I very much hope that, you know, this is the beginning of a, a set of discussions or, or a continuation of discussions since we're, this isn't really the beginning of anything, but it's not the end of it either. I think that's my key point. Yes. So we very much look forward to uh, continuing these conversations with ANAPI, with, uh, with other communities around these issues in Brazil. Um, because there's a lot of exciting energy that uh, we see happening all over the place that, uh, that has great potential to make a really lasting change. Cool. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> So with that, I think we can we can close. Unless uh, you have any final words, Guilherme? I'd like you to thank you, you, you all because I think we achieved some great results uh, concerning the not only the the challenge of uh, discussing, preparing, and finalizing both documents. It was. Uh, I, I can I totally acknowledge the relevance, uh, the strength, and, and the complexity of providing such work. Uh, and this, I'd like to thank you for, for your effort and for the quality of the results. And uh, I, as you mentioned, I think we'll keep the conversation going because uh, most of the next steps, they, they, come to, they, they can be considered challenges for our next phase. So I think the reports clearly uh, state uh, what has been done so far and what could be done next 
and it's on us to create next steps and and go to the next achievements. So thank you all, and uh, it would be good to continue this partnership, also in disseminating results and sharing the next step and providing visions on what we have done so that we can uh, continue to participate in this uh, community of knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, and thanks everyone for participating. Uh, we'll finish there. Cheers.